All right, everybody. This has taken me a couple, a couple attempts because um, I can't flip the camera while I'm recording, and every time I would try to do it, it would stop the video, and I had to start all over. So literally, what I tried to write for you to show you, I had to write it in reverse so that when I flipped the camera around, you could see it normal. It took me a while. I wasn't very good at arts and crafts time. First of all, good morning. Welcome uh, to Friday, um, March 27th. This is anatomical kinesiology. So if you are in biomechanics, you better not confirm that you watched this video. Not your video. This is KNES 310, anatomical kinesiology video. And I'm super happy to be here. I have my guest, uh, Two-Face in the back, my co-host. And uh, we're going to get right into it, man. This is going to be a good lecture. This right here is going to be this, uh, really accelerating the content that's going to be on your test, okay, as you're going to see. So let's uh, rewind where we are at this point. You guys were introduced to planes and axes. You were introduced to the concepts of fetal and out of fetal, which is sagittal plane type movement patterns. Uh, you guys went through the gauntlet of motion, cervical wrist, elbow, shoulder, scapula, right? You guys should be constantly reviewing that. If you're awake, you can practice anatomical kinesiology. If you're moving, you can practice anatomical kinesiology. Right elbow flexion, right elbow extension, left elbow flexion, left elbow extension, that kind of stuff, okay? Then I talk to you about, well, if joints move, what's moving them? Muscles are moving them, and we have as many uh, groups of muscles as we have joint motions. In other words, the puppeteer needs strings in every direction of motion that that puppet allows for. It's the same thing with our muscles. We have as many muscle groups. Remember, no skeletal muscle works by itself. We have as many muscle groups as we have joint motions. Every allowable joint motion has muscles that pull in that direction. Cervical flexors pull in the direction of cervical extension left transverse cervical rotators pull in the direction of left transverse cervical rotation. And remember one of our commandments, we do not, cat wants to go out, of course. Go me new. We do not associate muscles with motion because that would assume that the muscle is always responsible for that motion. As we know, that's not the case. Another a, a, an example of this I gave you last lecture is when you work in curls, right? When you work in your bicep, which is in the elbow flexor group because it pulls in the direction of elbow flexion. We cannot say that the bicep is always responsible for elbow flexion. We can't say that because when you're doing curls, half of the time you're extending the elbow. So the same group of muscles can be working and produce two different motions, flexion and extension. So how is that possible? Well, you had the same group of muscles, the change in motion was because of the change in the contraction type. The flexion by the flexors was concentric and the extension by the flexors was eccentric. And I'm gonna to get to how there is a relationship between those two things and it fits a nice equation perfectly. Um, that's always true. And remember, you can have a group of muscles working with no motion, isometrics, right? If I'm just gonna hold this position for a while, external force is trying to extend me, I'm preventing that through isometric work, preventing motion, okay? Let me do a quick analogy uh, for this concept as well, okay? So at my wrist, I have wrist flexors, muscles that pull in the direction of flexion, I have ulna deviators, I have radial deviators, I have wrist extensors. Remember, muscles that pull that way. They don't always necessarily cause that motion. So let's do a little thought experiment with an elevator and imagine all of my wrist extensors, muscles that pull in the direction of wrist extension, right? So I have this little string that's gonna represent those muscles. Those muscles obviously inside my skin, they pull this way. But for this example, I'm gonna pretend like they're pulling on my knuckle here and they pull like an elevator cable, okay? So the first thing is that gravity is trying to 
do what to my wrist? I could do a thought experiment, snip the string, it was gonna plop down because gravity is trying to flex me. Now, I can put my wrist in a position where gravity is trying to extend me. So it's not to say gravity is always trying to flex you. It's that in this position, under these circumstances, gravity is trying to flex me. So you can do a simple thought experiment to say, well, if gravity is trying to flex me, how do I know? Well, if gravity is trying to flex me and I observe no motion, my wrist extensors have to be doing a job above resting tone, and their job is to prevent flexion from happening. If I'm gonna keep this position, no motion, wrist extensors are doing a job, isometric work. Okay, let's say I cut the string, I attach another string, I attach another string to my fingers, and I need to get my wrist in that straight, rigid link. I want to get my wrist back to anatomical position. Well, my wrist flexors can't do that. My wrist flexors can't get me back to anatomical. My wrist flexors only pull in the direction of flexion, and they can't push me up, right? Muscles can only pull. So my only option here is to take a string that pulls in the direction of wrist extension and actually cause wrist extension to get me up to anatomical. So notice that relationship. Wrist extensors need to be called to do a job. Wrist extensors. I just observed wrist extension to get me to anatomical, to get my rigid link, to get my wrist back in the neutral. Wrist extensors, wrist extension. Extensors, the group of muscles that pull in a certain direction. Extension, a joint motion. Wrist extensors responsible for wrist extension, concentric work. I'm going to show you in my little equation that I wrote. That has to be. The only way the wrist extensors can produce wrist extension is through concentrics. It's through shortening while trying to shorten above resting tone. It has to be. There's no exceptions. The only way the wrist extensors can make your wrist extend is through shortening while trying to shorten above resting tone, and that is the definition of concentric work. Okay, let's do the other one. Wrist extensors working above resting tone to do a job. What if those muscles that pull into the rest of wrist extension allow you to flex? Now, why allow? Well, that's how I'm choosing to do it. Gravity could flex me, and my wrist flexors could flex me, but if my wrist flexors and gravity both try to flex me at the same time, you would observe this. Because you got two forces pulling on the, on, on the strut. Remember the tug of war? If I got a force this way and a force that way with nothing on the other side, that rope is gonna go fast. So the point is, is that my wrist extensors are doing a job. They are allowing the flexion slower than what gravity is offering to do. That's a job. Now, when you lower the baby in the crib, you want to control the speed. You want to make it go down slow. That's a job. That is a job. So the wrist extensors, muscles that pull, in this case, up. I know this is a linear concept, but maybe it will help some of you guys get it. The muscles that in this example are pulling up can allow you to go down by being lengthened while still trying to shorten. That's eccentric. So notice the relationship. Wrist extensors doing a job allowing the flexion of the wrist. Wrist extensors, a group of muscles that pull in the direction of extension, allowing flexion motion in the opposite direction of their pull, the only way that's possible is through eccentric work. So that's the relationship between muscle agonistic groups and motion and contraction. Contraction is proven. We prove contraction. We don't guess. I think it's concentric. I think it's, no, you're going to have enough clues. You're going to have enough variables. You're going to have enough factors to prove that contraction exists.
So let's first go to something we should be familiar with, and that is a basic equation. A plus B is equal to C. You guys remember that from algebra? And if we have two variables, we can solve for the third. So if I tell you A is 3 and C is 7, then we can easily deduce that B must be 4. There's no exceptions. B must be 4 to make it make sense. Now notice on the bottom, I give you the first two and we solve for C. If A is 3 and B is 4, C must be 7. And guys, this is how muscles, joint motion, and contractions are related. They are variables to an equation that I'm about to give you guys. Now, I had to painstakingly, <laughs> I was, wasn't very good in art, I had to write all of this in reverse. So that way, when I showed it to you on your camera, on the camera, it wasn't mirrored, it wasn't flipped. So that's why the handwriting is a little extra crazy. So guys, here it is, man. This is kinesio math, kinesio algebra. The relationship here is A, B, C. A means identified agonist, the muscle group that's doing a job. And I taught you last class how to solve for that. We figure out agonist. We figure out if a muscle is working. Why? Because of external forces. Why does it need to work? So once you've figured out who's working, right, we solve for A. I taught you how to observe for B. B is body joint motion. Now, why did I have to say body joint motion? Because I had to get a B in there for the equation. But I taught you how to solve for B. What's the motion? So my point is, is that if you can figure out A and you can figure out B, C is given to you. C is solved for. C is proven, not guessed. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you figured out that elbow flexors are working. So let's say we're doing a curl, right? Or the, the, we're on the, 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 the bicep curls. We're doing curls. And you know that you're working your elbow flexors, of which the biceps break eyes apart. But you figure out that elbow flexors are working, and then you observe. If the person is flexing while the elbow flexors are working, the only way that can take place, the only way that's possible, is if those muscles are working concentrically, shortening while trying to shorten above resting tone. Let's say you lower it down. The elbow flexors are still doing a the job. They are controlling the speed of the extension. So if you know your biceps working, if you know your elbow flexors are working, and you observe elbow extension, the only way that's possible is through eccentric work. The muscle is being lengthened while it's still trying to shorten above resting tone. And if you know the elbow flexors are working, let's say you're doing a curl and you just hold that position for a, a couple seconds, take a picture, admire your guns. The only way the elbow flexors can be responsible for no motion is through isometric work. Guys, that's your relationship, man. Okay? That is your relationship. I created those equations to simplify this process, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback from former students, okay? A lot of good feedback that it makes it simple. The equation emphasizes the relationship between agonistic muscles, muscles who are doing a job, the motions that can be observed or sometimes not observed if there's no motion, and the contractions that have to be applied. Think of it like that. The muscles that you figure out are working, the motions that you know what they are, and the contraction type that had to be applied to make those two things work. Okay? So let's do that equation with example. Okay? Oh, by the way, if you've made it this far, 
the secret code word for proving you watch this whole lecture is finished. Finished. Write finished in the comments for today's lecture. It's uh, March 27th, Friday. Friday. We made it to the weekend. All right. Check this out. Agonist, who's working? My elbow flexors. How do I know they're working? Because I ask myself, what's the external force trying to do? The external force is trying to extend me. I don't need extensors. I don't need tricep and his buttons. I need bicep and his buddies. Bicep and his buddies is what we call elbow flexors, a group of muscles, flexors, plural, a group of muscles that pull in the direction of elbow flexion. In this case, I need them to do a job because I have an external force trying to extend me. So A is solved for, identified. I need my flexors. The same external force, same agonist. And the variations in motion is going to be because of variations in work. Now watch how we figure this out. We're going to solve for contraction. We're going to solve for the work. Elbow flexors are working. They're doing a job. How do I know? Because if I snip the string, it's going to fall and it's going to cause extension. So if I'm just holding it in this position, my elbow flexors are responsible for no observable motion through isometric work. Elbow flexors, working above resting tone, doing a job, no motion observed, isometric work, A, B, C. Elbow flexors, no body joint motion, isometric contraction. Now, what if I observe this? A to B, start to finish, here to there. Let's do our equation. Flexors still working, External force still trying to extend me. A, what's my agonistic group? Flexors. What's my body joint motion? I observed flexion. I observed elbow flexion. Well, the only way the flexors can be responsible for flexion when they're working above resting tone is through concentric work. Flexors cause flexion through concentric contraction. Shortening while trying to shorten. Doing what they're trying to do causing motion in the direction of their pull. Get it? Let's do the last one. Elbow flexor is still working because my external force is still trying to extend me. What if I observe extension? Now, you might say, well, wouldn't the tricep do that? <clears throat> not if you, don't, not if you want, don't want to hurt yourself. I already have gravity wanting to extend me pretty fast. If I actually use muscles that pull that way, I would cause extension faster than gravity with a weight. I could feel my elbow throbbing from that. No, 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 no. I need my flexors to control the speed of gravity to make my extension happen slower than what gravity can offer. So let's put it to our equation. Flexors still working because external force still trying to extend me. The only way the flexors can be responsible for extension Motion in the opposite direction of their pull is through eccentric contraction. Because my muscle is being lengthened. My muscle is being lengthened while it's still trying to shorten. Elbow flexors, elbow extension, eccentric contraction. Guys, that is a law. That has to be the case. There's no exceptions. Because that's basic physics. You all see Two-Face? My co-host, hey, what's up, Two-Face? So, that's it, man. So now we, what we can do is we can take that equation and we can apply it all over the place. Remember, all of these examples that I'm giving you today from yesterday are activities of daily living, slow and controlled motion, which is a majority of human motion, Exercises, most of exercises are slow and controlled, especially when you're doing therapy in the weight room with machines and dumbbells. That does not mean you can't go fast. That does not mean you can't choose to go faster than gravity. We just have to look at that a little different on our equations because um, I'll get to that when we do our exceptions. But 
any time on the test, this is what's going to separate people who listen to these videos. Any time on the test that I put exercise, you're doing this exercise, this is an exercise, an exercise that's working the elbow flexors. Exercise means within activity of daily living type of motion, slow and controlled, slow and controlled, doing curls. You don't do curls as many times as you can, slow and controlled, slow and controlled. And the reason we're gonna do them slow and controlled is because that's gonna slow down the process to get you guys to really see who's working, how are they working, and the different motions they can be responsible for, okay? So let's do some application of this equation, okay? Let's say I have a, I'm gonna use this baseball, but it could be an arbitrary weight. Let's see if I have something. No. So, the mass of my hand is a weight itself, but I'm gonna put a ball in there just to emphasize the weight, okay? So let's say I have my wrist in this position. You have to first say, what's the external force trying to do to my wrist? Flex me. Do I need flexors to keep my wrist in this neutral anatomical position posture? I don't need flexors. Gravity's already trying to flex me. I need to recruit. I need to turn on. I need to innervate extensors above rest. They're doing a job. They don't normally do this job. They're doing a job to prevent my hand in the baseball from flexing. So I identified the wrist extensors as the agonistic group. I am observing no motion. So the only way the extensors can be responsible for no motion is to isometric work. I proved to you that my wrist extensors have to be working isometrically. Okay? Now, shake the etch of sketch. What if I started here and I said, hey, wrist, I need you to go back to your anatomical position. Once again, I don't need flexors. Flexors can't push me up. Muscles can only pull. So you know who I need? I need my wrist extensors to make me extend. Wrist extensors, responsible for wrist extension only through concentric contraction. A, wrist extensors. B, body joint motion, wrist extension. C, concentric contraction. See how that works? Okay. Now, what if I say, okay, I'm ready to go back to being flexed. If I use my flexors, slow and controlled, I need the elevator cables that pull this way. Wrist extensors still doing a job. In this case, the wrist extensors job is to produce slow flexion, slower than what gravity can offer. The only way the wrist extensors, the agonists that pull in the direction of wrist extension can produce flexion is through eccentric contraction. The muscle is being lengthened while it's still trying to shorten above resting tone. It is being lengthened while still pulling in the direction of extension above rest. It means the same thing, okay? All right, let's flip it. Let's do an example where I'm using my flexors, okay? In this case, gravity is trying to extend my wrist, right? Do a thought experiment. So if I wanna maintain my wrist in a neutral position, in anatomical, I need my wrist flexors. The only way the wrist flexors are gonna to work to produce no motion is through isometrics, isometric work. Now, let's say I observe flexion. Let's look at our equation. And what if I said, hey guys, what type of contraction is happening from here to there? Again, the intent is to show you how you can prove that. You don't have to guess. You could say, well, let me first identify who's working. My wrist flexors are working. Why? Because the ball is trying to extend me. My wrist flexors are working. That's my agonistic group. I've identified my agonist. Wrist flexors are my agonist. Now, 
What body joint motion do I observe? I'm observing wrist flexion. Remember, follow the fingers to flexion. And the only way the wrist flexors can be responsible for wrist flexion is through concentric contraction. Okay. What if I observe extension in this example? In this example, my wrist flexors are still working. I observe wrist extension. The only way the wrist flexors can be responsible for wrist extension is through eccentric contraction. Wrist flexors through concentric. Wrist flexors through eccentric. Wrist flexors through concentric. Wrist flexors through isometric. Wrist flexors through eccentric. All of which can be proven. That's the key. This should make sense. It must be. All right? Let's do a couple more while we're on a roll. What if I had a jug of water? Who's working at my wrist? Now, I am not in a sagittal plane of my wrist. I am now in a frontal plane of my wrist. So, who do I need to call to do a job? The water is trying to do this to my wrist. The weight, gravity, pulling on the mass of the jug and my hand is trying to do this. So there's my thumb, there's my pinky, remember? Follow the thumb, follow the pinky. The jug is trying to ulna deviate me. So I need muscles that pull in a direction of radial deviation, thumb side. If I'm trying to hold the jug level and not move my wrist, the only way my radial deviators are gonna prevent ulna deviation is through isometric work. And if I bring my wrist up to anatomical, the only way the radial deviators can produce radial deviation, radial deviators, agonist, radial deviation, body joint motion, concentric contraction, shortening while trying to shorten above resting tone, doing what they're trying to do. And then if I observe this, like to pour water out without spilling, radial deviator still working, but I observe ulna deviation, the only way the radial deviators can be responsible for ulna deviation is through eccentric contraction. And that's the bottom line. Cause Stone Cold said so. Guys, that's it, man. That's the magic. That is the secret to figuring out contraction. Identifying the group of muscles that are working, then observing the motion Remember, no motion is still a type of motion. I know that sounds crazy, but zero is a number. Zero is a number. No motion is identifying motion because you're like, well, what's the motion? Oh, it's not moving. None. There's no motion. That's still identifying motion. Identify the agonistic group. I observe the motion. Prove the contraction. Identify the agonist, observe the motion, prove the contraction. Contraction is proven. Contraction comes last. Contraction comes last. Who's doing the job? How are they doing the job in terms of contraction type is going to be based on the motion you observe. Different ways you can look at it. So, if you guys understand that, hopefully by now with my examples, then we can play around with the variables. Again, we can play around with the variables. Meaning that if I give you contraction, if I give you contraction, if I say, hey, you're gonna do eccentric work. You're going to do eccentric contraction of your elbow flexors. What motion do you need to make sure you observe? Extension. Now, why is this concept important? It's going to be important for you therapists, you athletic trainers, 
even you fitness professionals, fitness studies. You know why? Because sometimes you're going to need to work muscles with a specific type of contraction, eccentrics. Sometimes you want to do things with just concentrics you know, based on your rehab schedule. So if you want to work a bicep in his buddies, the flexors, bicep in his buddies, but you want to do eccentrics, you need to be able to set this scenario up in your head and say, well, I need to make sure I have an external force that's trying to extend me to engage those muscles, to turn on those muscles, to make those muscles work above resting tone. Now, where do I go from here? What do I tell the client or the patient? What do I tell them to do? I'm trying to extend their elbow to recruit the flexors. Now, where do I tell them to go? Do I tell them to go here or do I tell them to go there? So you want eccentric contraction. You set up an ex an, a scenario, you set up an experiment where you're gonna recruit the flexors. Now you better know what motion you wanna cause. You see what I'm trying to get to? So you can want C, you set it up for A, and then you better tell them the right motion in order for this to make sense. From here you say, okay, now slowly make your hand go away from you. Flexors, extension, eccentric contraction. Okay? So you're going to have to be able to play with those variables in different ways. On the test, this is going to be a majority of your work, of your, excuse me, muscle questions is going to be understanding the link, understanding the relationship between muscles that pull in certain directions of motion, observable motions, and the contraction types that had to be responsible for making those two things happen. Okay? Uh, remember, if you have any questions, any questions at all, email me. Text me. You have my cell number. We can FaceTime to figure stuff out. I'm willing to do it. You guys got to reach out, okay? Um, and today's secret word to prove to me, man, can you imagine? Sometimes I'll get watched with a big smiley face or exclamation point like they were really excited to watch it. And I know darn well they didn't watch the whole thing. So finished and and remember i don't want to hear nothing well uh, every time you say the secret word i just so happen to be in the bathroom or something i just pause the video you can watch this over and over and over again there's really no excuse and it's not that i'm trying to be I'm trying to be a, a teacher who makes sure you get all the information that's all man it's only because i care and i want you to be able to get all the questions right on the test and the only way you're going to do that is if you watch these lectures. So today's secret password confirmation is finished. Finished. Happy Friday, everybody. Be safe. Please practice social distancing. Don't get in the large groups. Please, 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 please. Just stay at home. Stay at home and apply anatomical kinesiology to your life. Y'all make it a good one.